All right, let's talk to Father. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We, we thank you that, number one, you're not letting us grow stagnant, but you're unveiling more and more of yourself, your purpose, and your plan so that we can align ourselves in the spirit with your work. Father, allow you and understand what you're doing. Lord, your heart is that we might know your ways. And too often we have just known your acts. Bring us out of the action into the person. Even in this as we share how to chew, check and prove the word of the Lord. Help us tonight open our ears, open our hearts, and give impartation into our spirits of that which you're saying. So that when we've forgotten the knowledge, the spirit of it will come up and guide us, we pray. In your precious name, amen. amen. So this is the final lesson. And I always have to go through all of these things and condense them because I have ad infinium of, of uh, notes and stuff like that. So, But let's look at this. In 1 Corinthians 14.10, Paul said that every voice has some significance. Questions. How do I find a voice's significance and know its source? Number two, how do I properly test and prove a voice that's being as being from the Lord. Three, is it possible to know which prophetic voice is speaking his word? Four, is there a way of checking out what I hear prophetically before I release it? All of the answers to all of these questions I had to learn, uh, what do you call it, on the job training. <laughs> because we were not taught this in Bible school. And we weren't taught it at any of the seminars I went to or any of the conferences I went to. And yet pastors were asking me once I got teaching the college, how do I know if I've heard the voice of God? And I thought, if pastors are asking that question, what condition are the sheep in? Amen. He said, my sheep know my voice. But the other side of that is, my people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. And so there's a, there's a balance between those two, isn't there? I like my little balance beams my, and my big balance beams. Okay. All of these questions are valid and to some extent will be answered in this portion of the course. And there are some who think it's a sin to prove God. Oh, it's the word of the Lord. Don't touch it. Well, he said prove how much? all things does that include the prophetic word that includes whatever i preach so when you come saturday and sunday and i'm preaching check me out all right john 10 4 through 8 and when he put forth his own sheep he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice if i'm going to be a sheep i need to ask god to show me how to know the voice of the shepherd. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what, thing, what things they were which he spake unto them. And then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am, I am the door of what? Not the, although he is the door of the sheepfold, there's a further working. He's the only way into the hearts of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I want to be a sheep who can only hear one voice. Otherwise I'm in bad trouble. You got, I got to get in my humor before I finish. All right.
prove all things. It's important to look at the following passages in the light of proving God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. This is possibly the most important scripture on this subject. This seems to imply that some of the things that I endeavor to prove will not be good. And I still will need to sort or discern my way through them. Learning how to do that is the subject of this portion of the course. When we think of proving God, the question arises that arises is, how do I prove God? Well, number one, my attitude must be right. It has to be a W-H-Y-N-E, not a W-H-I-N-E. If it's a W-H-I-N-E, I can get in trouble. But if it's a wanting to know the why so I can learn the ways of God, God approves of that and answers those questions. Now, let me say this. He may take some time to set the stage before he answers your question. We live in a, uh, an age of internet and you can get the answers almost in the snap of a finger. God doesn't do it that way. God sets the stage so in the experience there's something imparted into your spirit of the substance of himself. Sometimes that takes a setting of a stage. But the impartation, let me tell you uh, just a quick story. Um, Brother Wade Taylor, who was the president of Pinecrest for quite a number of years, and the closest thing I had to a spiritual father, he passed away. He was 89, and the Lord had told him, get packed up, you're moving. He didn't realize he was moving to a permanent place. But he sat down in his chair and went. Wow. Yeah. Just that simple. Way to go, huh? mm -hmm. Everything was, the house was packed up. Wow. All the family had to do was come in and take all this stuff out of the apartment. And So anyway, when he, when he, I could not go to the funeral. It was in Maryland, I think, and we were, we were in New York, weren't we? So, we were in Pennsylvania. Yes, anyway, I sat down in the living room and I watched the two and a half hour celebration of his life. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And then I felt exhausted. And I felt empty. And I went to bed and slept probably like I hadn't slept in months. Mm -hmm. And I woke up and I felt full again. I said, Lord, what was that all about? He said, I removed from you the impartation that he had put in your, in your life or in your, in your being over the years that you'd known him. Because I wanted you to feel impartation's footprint. Wow. All of us have a footprint in us of impartation. With me, it was just that one that God was showing me. I'm not sure I could have stood it if he took all the impartation I received over the years out. But there's something about the spiritual reality of impartation that the church needs to get a hold of. We carry far more than we realize because when we have been open to the Spirit of God, there is substance put into our spirit. Faith is the substance. There's a substance of faith that goes into our spirit when we receive the word of the Lord and we receive the spirit of that word. When it's an anointed word, there is spirit that an invisible that goes into our spirit. Okay? So we want to look at how do I prove what is of God? Romans 12 and 2, there are levels of the will of God, and they're basically listed here in Romans 12 and 2. It's possible to know each level. Now catch this scripture, because we've got to destroy the vestiges of that lie that says we cannot know the will of God. 
Paul said this, For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to, to desire that ye might be filled with what? The knowledge of his will. What does that mean? That means I can know his will. I can be filled with that knowledge. That's a spiritual, experiential knowledge. In all wisdom and what? How many have interpreted dreams and visions with a natural mind? Always. If God gives visions and dreams, there's always a spiritual understanding. There may be a natural understanding, but there's always a spiritual one. If I'm to believe this. Okay? It's important that we catch that and realize there's much more than we've been taught. There is a substance that God is putting in our being so that when we go to the other side, we have substance. Many are going to arrive and have no substance because they never obtained the faith and moved in faith in believing, not only in believing, but asking God to work that in their being. Working it in your being gives you substance. So, in Romans 12 and 2, there's the good will of God. There's the acceptable will of God. Or there's the good will of God, the outer court. The acceptable will, will of God, the holy place. The perfect will of God is full maturity or the holiest of all. Romans 12 and 1, we grow into knowing these. It's not something that all of a sudden we know. It's a growth development. There are natural understandings of his will, and that's important. But there are spiritual understandings of his will as well. Both are necessary, and it's possible to know the fullness of each. Lord, bring us to that place, for we will walk with confidence, but not arrogance. In Judges 6 and 39, one of the ways of proving God, the first way we're going to look at, is the fleece. Now, I was brought up to believe that the fleece was a latch-stitch effort and the least of the ways God proved. It was just, you know, and some of that may have been the context. I mean, Gideon had had the angel appear to him. And some of us think, if I had an angelic visitation, I believe. Well... Maybe not. <laughs> and then the angel, you know, took up the sacrifice and then disappeared, but God still spoke to him after that. So here we have not just a simple meeting with an angel, not, not just a, a supernatural acceptance of sacrifice, but we have the voice of God speaking as well and Gideon still did not, was not sure it was God. That gives me hope. Because <laughs> there are times when I am not sure. I mean, especially if you speak something way out here that I've never heard before. I rebuke it and it doesn't go. <laughs> there are times, there are times when I rebuke it and I do everything I can to to try and not believe it, but God doesn't, uh, he ju it just gets stronger and stronger. And so I know that's one of the ways I know that it's God. Because if it's the enemy and you rebuke it, he has to go. And so sometimes the intensity will lead me to the timing. Okay? Here we find Gideon proving God concerning a specific word he'd heard. The interesting thing is that he first heard this word through the physical appearance of an angel. This clearly puts using the fleece as a way of proving God. The ultimate place of hearing. In the multitude of voices that are speaking in the world, we need to hear and learn to prove the voice of God. It's through this that we will know the truth of John 10, 4 and 5. And he putteth forth his own sheep, and he goeth where? Well, if Jesus went before them, should we go before our sheep if we're shepherds? 
I remember when we lived in a Christian community, my oldest son was 11 at the time, but he was also the keeper of the sheep. And one of the men of the camp thought, I'm going to help little Timothy out. And he tried to drive the sheep through the camp. All oh, these women had these nice flowers and they were in bloom. And <clears throat> the little lawnmowers went over <laughs> enjoyed the taste of the, of the flowers until my son came and got to the head of them. Then they all fall, fell in behind him and from that point on, no flowers were touched. Wow. We have got to learn how to lead sheep not drive them. Okay? I just want to put that out there. Somewhere, the body of Christ and the ministry of God must learn to lead the sheep and not drive them. And when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This applies to every fold that God has set up. I don't care what the denomination, I don't care what the, the emphasis of that group, if God has put that shepherd in place, he needs to learn how to lead the sheep and not drive them. Okay? In Judges 6, 36 to 40, God had spoken to Gideon through an angel and through the word of the Lord by his voice. Gideon is one who has no confidence in his ability to hear or see. We all start there. It's not, it's not, not a bad place to be unless you're stuck there. Okay? It's a growth stage, and we need to recognize that when people begin to hear God's voice. Don't be too hard on them. Look back to where you started. Okay? He has to put before the Lord a test to prove with the fleece the word of the Lord. Note the progression of God persuading Gideon. There's a passage of scripture in Hebrews 11. Let's go there. I love this passage of scripture. In fact, I used it the other night when we were talking about uh, someone who was endeavoring to bring someone to the Lord. Hebrews. Oops. Hebrews 11. And I think it's verse 13. Yes. Let's look at verse 12. Uh, yeah. Let's start at verse 11. Through Sarah, also, through faith, Sarah also herself received strength to conceive a seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Just let me say this. How many have read this, the incident about the, about the Lord and coming down and going to Abraham? Mm -hmm. you remember what Sarah did when, when God said next year at this time? Yeah. She left. But that was not an act of lack of faith. Could have been delighted. <laughs> well, the, her comments after let us know that she's having a struggle believing it. But God did, uh, what I want to emphasize is God did not count that a lack of faith. We would have, wouldn't we? He sees things a little different than we do, doesn't he? And she was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So that was a faithful laugh. Okay. Therefore sprang there even one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sands which are is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith. Now listen carefully. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. Then the Lord said to me, Bill, 
I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. If I persuaded them back then, you can ask me to persuade them now. Doesn't that take a lot of pressure off you? We've tried to persuade people. I've come to the place, if they don't believe, I said, well, just ask the Lord to persuade you. You don't even have to believe he's there, just ask him. He'll persuade you. He'll convince you, and when God convinces you, you're stuck. You have to do something. Okay? They not only, uh, having seen the promises afar off, were persuaded of them, then they embraced them. They did not embrace them until they were persuaded. Hello? Too often we try and convince people. If God persuades them, they'll embrace it. Embrace them and confess they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What, what a phenomenal scripture. God took his time persuading Gideon. And God never once said, Gideon, why don't you believe? In fact, when Gideon, I think, was afraid to ask again, after the third time, God said, now if you still doubt, Take your servant and go down to the enemy's camp by night. God gave an ungodly man a dream and his ungodly friend the interpretation. That convinced Gideon to take the first step. Folks, God is out to persuade us. God is, he wants to use us more than we want to be used. He wants to convince us more than we really want to be convinced. And we need to allow for that. We need, And that's why we teach on proving the voice of God. God was, it's possible to believe that the first proving, God was gracious, even though it already had two signs that very few have. Yet God never remonstrated Gideon's need of multiple proofs that the commissioning was of him. Isn't that powerful? Lord, we have so reduced a relationship. Listen, if God is convincing you, it's increasing your relationship with him. It's, con it's increasing your belief in him. And we need, folks, we need to let God do his work. We don't do a good job of his work. It's him that convicts the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment to come. It's not me. By the way, when God told, reminded me of that, he, he took away all my preaching material. Because I was telling people what sin was. I was telling people how to be righteous. I gave them the clothesline message. And oh, by the way, most of the time the clothesline message is preached to the women. Your, your your neck your, your dress has to be so high in the neck and so long in the down to the ankles and your long sleeves and hair up to here. <laughs> well, I had, I had an aunt who who took over three hours to put her hair up, and she never cut it once in her whole lifetime. Well, she could stand on it. Did you ever see it long? No, I didn't see it long, but I did see it piled. She was a good pilot. All right. <laughs> but, you know, the, I, I tried to convince them what righteousness was. And then I preached on the judgment to come. That's all the Holy Spirit's work. My work is to create a context whereby they will believe the Holy Spirit and feel free to let God deal with them, where they feel safe to let God deal with the, the doubt and all that other stuff that comes along with that. Principles shown in Judges 6, 36 to 40. God, in responding to Gideon's second stage of proving him, showed a number of things. It's important to see how far God went to convince his choice 
that it was God's will for his life to lead Israel. Number one, God is merciful. He did not judge Gideon for doubting, and he won't judge you for doubting, and he won't judge those that we bring to him for doubting. We all start out in that place. You know, so many condemn Thomas, but we're all there. Second of all, God is long-suffering. He spent time convincing Gideon and allaying his doubts and fears. Three, God's desire to convince us of his desire to use us. It is God's desire to convince us. I don't have to convince myself. Well, we better not go down that road, had we? <laughs> Four, God will go to whatever measure necessary to convince us if our heart is right in the matter. Number five, these principles are true for the prophetic speakings of God as well. Remember, faith is built. We go from faith to faith. God is building his house with blocks of faith and people of faith. He wants to mature faith in me so he can put me in the larger body of Christ, that temple that he's building, or that city that he's building. 1 John 4, 1 to 3, the process of trying the spirits is a portion of this lesson. Note it's trying the spirit behind the message. I Listen, the thing that convinced me of this was reading Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. The devil quoted the scripture letter perfect, but the spirit behind it made it wrong. That's scary. Okay? But we need to hear that because sometimes it sounds absolutely right. My first church back in 1969, 70, was a little church on the edge of an Indian reservation. Those, a white, white lady and a white uh, uh, Indian lady built it and they fought over the foundation. So I came along and one of the things that, that I had to do was, uh, and the church believed in prophecy. This side would prophesy against this side. <laughs> well, I was, you know, they were being led by a green pastor. Uh, and, but I knew one thing, that that was not God. They thought it was. They were correcting each other with prophecy. <laughs> I've been everywhere, my man. And so, in the midst of that, I said, God, what do I do? He said, I want you to search the scriptures, find every scripture on prophets and prophecy, and write it down in the book. So, I didn't have a computer then. I had strong concordance. King James Bible in a notebook. And I would write the scripture out by hand and then leave some space to put something in afterwards. When I'd done that, I brought it back to the Lord and I said, now, Lord, I've done my homework. Would you help me? <laughs> and he gave me a principle for each one of the scriptures I'd written out. And he, I said, now what do I do? He said, teach this. And he gathered together a number of scriptures. He said, teach this on prophets. So I didn't know any better. Well, the next Sunday after I finished teaching it, there was only one left in the church. <laughs> you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Is that up and left? They left. Yeah, only have one left. What was that? Did they ever come back? Well, some of them did. But when they came back, they had a different attitude. So I, I just left time for the Holy Spirit to deal with them because I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> and he dealt with them. We never had that problem again. There's another incident uh, with, with that uh, church that this fellow came. And we had kind of an open pulpit. Remember, we've talked in our divine government class of how a service ought to be run. 
And I didn't know how to do it, but I did anyway back then. And this fellow came and he got up and he ministered a message and it sounded right. But something in here went, you know, like fingernails on a chalkboard. So most of us are old enough to remember that. Um, and I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, bring him home and feed him. Well, all we had in the house, we were living by faith. All we had in the 60 passenger bus we lived in was cookies and tea. That was to feed our two kids as well. We had some interesting experiences there too, but anyway, I sat, he had someone with him and they came in and the bus and we had this little table that we'd made at the front. And so put the kids to bed and we begin talking. The Lord gave me questions to ask. And I found out why I was so, why the nails on the chalkboard? Because he was called of God to raise up the heads of the 144,000 in the book of Revelation. And I was called to be one of those heads. I said, no, thank you. <laughs> he came back later, and again he went to the pulpit and he began preaching against the second return. Now some of the folks in the congregation would have accepted that because they were looking for revelation. So I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, first of all, pray him down. So we did. And he, you know, after five minutes, he said, boy, the devil really doesn't want me to get this message out. <laughs> I'm having terrible opposition. Two minutes later, he sat down. And I said, now what do I do, Lord? He said, get up and say, many will say in that day, I am the Christ, believe it not. See, there are ways to correct, and he didn't even know he was being corrected. He came back later and he couldn't even get to the pulpit. There, we can know, we, we've got to pay attention to what God is saying inside. That In that context, I learned discernment. I didn't have discernment before. I knew the word. Now, how many know you can know the word, but if you don't have discernment, or at least begin to let God teach it to you, you can still go out to lunch. I had not Oh, I won't go there. I got a few stories. But anyway. Um, I love your stories. <laughs> so, the message can be true. What's that? This is our last class. I know, but it doesn't have to be the class of eternal length. <laughs> Okay, well, when we, uh, after, after we left the church, uh, we, the last Sunday, someone brought us a sheep for us and gave it to us as an offering. And we were getting ready to travel, oh, about 250 miles. So, after the service, we got the sheep in the, put the sheep in the back and put some hay down there and something for it to eat. Kids put the kids in bed and we traveled at night because it's easier to travel with the kids sleep. So we got to this one place and and uh, we lived there for a while and then moved to Peterborough, Ontario, and we were uh, we we were just beginning to set up work because some of the people had asked us if we would so. We are having meetings in our home, and these people came to the door and knocked. I thought, well, okay. He said, well, we're here, and we we begin to talk. You know, if, by the way, if you let the devil talk, he'll expose himself. He loves to be heard, and he will expose himself if you let him talk. So we let him talk. I mean, we let them talk. <laughs> There's more than one devil. No, I mean, <laughs> we, we, let, we let them talk. And they said, well, you know, it says that um, the 144,000 are, what is that the passage? It says uh, they've not defiled themselves with women. 
And so they said, we don't believe in getting married, or you can get married, but you have to remain celibate. What can I say? Why bother? Yeah, yeah why bother? <laughs> but, see, there's some strange things out there. You know, the Shakers tried that, and they all died out. Okay? But people believe some of these things. But when they came and, and we sussed them out, because we've been asked to, we basically told the fellow who asked us, is that don't have them in to speak. Why? Because they have this thread. Now they were using scripture, and they quoted it exactly right. But the spirit behind it was the problem. Okay? Remember that in tempting Jesus, Satan accurately quoted the word, but the spirit behind the quote was wrong. Jesus countered with a now application of the word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is written. Do you know what was written? It wasn't just written in the scripture of the scroll. It was written in Jesus' heart. And what you use in spiritual warfare is what God has written in your heart, not what's written in the book. I never heard it before, but like he was the God. In the, out of the mouth of God, that was him. Right. He meant the Father, but I've never heard it that way before. Like, spoke about itself. Yeah. It, it, see, it, it's, it's the thing. There are times when God has taken a portion of Scripture and applied it seemingly out of context. But because it was him authoring it, it had power to silence the enemy. If you look at the Gospels, I remember I was asked to teach um, hermeneutics class. I didn't even know who Herman was. Um, <laughs> but I was asked to teach a hermeneutics class and I, I was because I told people I will not teach the toolbox I'm going to teach the word not the toolbox and I was about to tell the, the president of this college no when the Lord said yes you will so I said yes and he and I had an intense discussion after I got off the phone then the Lord said most of the principles that are being taught about hermeneutics or interpreting the Word of God are before the 1906 revival, the Azusa Street revival. And I said, what do you mean? He said, nothing is being taught about prophetic interpretation of the Word. Not interpretation of prophecy, but prophetic interpretation of the Word. Let me give you an illustration. This is the last night. You guys said it. All right. <laughs> Turn to, to uh, Ephesians 4, put one finger in there, and the other scripture is Psalm 68. Ephesians 4 is a quote from Psalm 68. So seeing as I'm back there already, let me get that first. See, if I can find it in the life of Jesus, I can be pretty sure I'm okay, right? Yeah. Psalm 68, verse 18. And you'll recognize it as Ephesians 4 as well. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts from men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Turn over to Ephesians 4, and let's, let's just look at this quickly. And this is just one sample. Jesus, Jesus did this as well. But, of course, we were not taught this level of, even though I went to a school that believed in the prophetic, we weren't taught this. Why? Because it's dangerous. But it doesn't make it wrong. I need to know how to do these things and how to rightly divide. divide. Oh, you mean it can be divided? Mm -hmm. Rightly divide the word of truth. 
So Ephesians 4. Starting at verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above. Uh, no, let's see. Yeah. Far above all, all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, wait a minute. Where'd he go? Uh, just let me go back here for a minute. I think they're looking at first eight, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. Wherefore he verse eight of chapter four. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captives and gave gifts unto men. But that's not the whole quote, is it? You mean he lifted it right out of Psalm sixty-eight, set it down here, and didn't quote it all. That was a prophetic interpretation of Scripture. And so, although you can't teach them all the prophetic interpretation, you can teach them how to recognize it. And when God is speaking, sometimes God has lifted a phrase out, I've spoken into a person's life, and they came alive. We've got to know how to hear God, but if, see, if we're, if we're, I don't know, quite know how to say this, but it, if we only believe in contextual interpretation, then we won't be able to hear God say, take something and apply that could bring people into life. Now, I believe we need to respect and, and we need to honor and we need to really hear from God. But it is a valid thing that God does. And it by the way, in your own life, has God ever only spoken a phrase to you and not the whole context? I rest my case. And it brought life, didn't it? It changed your thinking. But we've never thought of using that on the larger scale. Okay? So when they asked me to teach, that's one of the things he talked to me about. There were several others. And, I mean, God gave me principles that I had never thought of but as soon as I thought of the 1906 revival and that most of the uh, hermeneutics was Baptist and Christian Missionary Alliance and all the moves before, I thought God didn't stop unveiling how to, how to unveil his word with those moves. Each of them was a step in God unveiling more and more of himself and his nature and character. Okay? We'll come around to some of that again. Now, uh, he also indicated by how he quoted the scripture that to obey Satan's accurate quoting of the word would have been an act of worship to Satan. Mm -hmm. That's a thought and a half, isn't it? If the message or messengers from the Lord, they will give you room to test and see if the word is from God. If the messenger does not give room or tries to condemn you for honest doubt, you should at least suspect the origin of the word. 1 Samuel 3 and 21. The Lord revealed himself by the word of the Lord. I love this scripture. This is one of the most important scriptures to be considered. Note the focus of God in speaking to Samuel. The principle of God revealing himself through or by the word of the Lord. That is a principle. Every word of the Lord should in some way reveal more of Jesus Christ. I like what uh, your friend Tim says. Is Jesus not enough? Sometimes we get so caught up with all this stuff that Jesus gets buried in it. Okay? But if it's really from God, it's going to reveal more of God himself and of Jesus Christ. Although it may be a prophetic word for someone, a vision, a dream, there ought to be a revelation of him, his character, his nature, or his heart in all of these things. If we study the times when God revealed himself to the patriarchs, 
we'll find that with each new need came a greater revelation of God, his abilities and his character traits. Each one of these were manifest in order to show us the true heart of God. So, Exodus 34, 5 through 7 lays out the characteristics that we should look for in the word of the Lord. Merciful. That's his highest trait, by the way. He always spoke from off, from above the mercy seat. You mean when I speak, I should always speak from the mercy seat. In other words, whatever I say should be pregnant with mercy. Okay? Gracious, oh my. Not sarcastic, not critical. Gracious. Then I had to have God redefine that for me. How many know that that's essential? Gracious. Long suffering. Long suffering is defined as suffering long with the faults of others. So if God is developing long suffering in you, he's going to send you people with lots of faults. So you get to choose to be long suffering or water the long suffering plant. I call it the banana of the spirit. <laughs> Abundant in goodness, abundant in truth. And again, we go back to mercy, keeping mercy in reserve for thousands. Do I have a reservoir of mercy? I want to be like him. Ask him to build your reservoir of mercy. So that your first reaction is one of mercy. Not of sympathy, but of mercy. Sympathy will kill. But of mercy. Forgiving iniquity, forgiving transgression, forgiving sin. Then he goes into the negatives. The church I was brought up in preached the negatives first. Come on. Legalistically. Religiously. And fearfully. They never taught that. They never no, we didn't. They didn't teach. It wasn't until I began to study Moses that I realized, wait a minute. God revealed himself to Moses, and this is how he did it. In a revelation of himself. So when God is speaking, there should be a revelation of him in the midst of what's being said, whether it's prophetic word, whether it's the ministry of the word, or something else. Vision, dream. There should be in, in there, there should be some revelation of his character and nature. In every vehicle God uses to communicate to his prophets, his focus is to reveal himself. Here's some penetrating character or questions to ask. When the word of the Lord comes, some of the questions we should ask ourselves are, what of the character of God can I see in this word? Second of all, what of the nature of God is revealed by this word? Three, how is the Lord revealed in the word? And four, is there a further unveiling of him to me in this word? Um, oh. Yes, please. So it gets on the... I, I want to know, how how do you deal with mercy, not sympathy? I mean, somebody's talking about the horrible things in their lives. How do you respond to them with mercy and not sympathy? I usually ask God to give me a scripture. And sometimes they're describing the dealings of God that they don't understand. They don't know that, but that's what they're describing. In mercy, I would then teach them. You, you know, it says, and this is an interesting passage of Scripture. I wish I knew the, the street addresses of them all, but it says, and Jesus saw them as sheep without a shepherd, and he was moved with compassion and taught them. In other words, compassion is love with the answer. Lord, 
teach us how to move in compassion. Lord, build your compassion in us so we can hear you give us the answer and move in compassion. Matthew 9.36. First Samuel 1 and 23, only the Lord establishes word. Only the Lord can establish his word. I cannot fulfill the word of God unless me sh he shows me how and enables me. Every time he speaks, I must go back to him asking him how he wants me to, to walk it out. Listen, everything God allows in your life is the thumb of God to push you into deeper relationship with him. Sometimes it's to increase your hunger. In Song of Solomon, she goes through three cycles of increasing hunger. By night, you know, first, it's just basically he's not there and she cries out and he comes. The second one, by night on my bed, I sought him, but I found him not. In other words, she was sleeping and yet awake. The third time, I'll go about the city and look for him. I can't find him. And the, the, the prophets, I mean, the, the, the watchmen that go about the city, they beat me because they didn't understand my hunger. We won't go there, but just hear that. If people do, sometimes we have accused people of church hopping when they're really hungry. We have accused them of backsliding when they've been going looking for food. Well, don't get me off there. I won't get back on track here. What's that? We were sighing at the same time. <laughs> oh, you were doing a duet. Yeah, we did. All right. In 2 Samuel 7, 25, And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. Only God can establish his word to me. I've watched people try and fulfill prophetic word that they've gotten over them, and it was a right prophetic word, but only God can establish his word. If I try and establish it, I, my feet are going to slip. But if he establishes my feet, he gives me hinds feet that can go in high places. Okay? In Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. In my heaven. Okay? He wants to settle his word in you so that you become an example of what his word looks like. So in 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 11, this is the dealings of God in a nutshell. The best, this is best expressed in a chart showing both the negative and positive aspects of trying the word of the Lord. Tried by positive outcomes as well. Please hear that. Some men and women have done well going through the afflictions, necessities, distresses stripes, imprisonments, and so on. But when it came to the prosperity, when it came to God testing them with prosperity or popularity, they failed the test. Yes. There, are, there are 12 gates to the city, and I found out that some of them are positive tests. Mm -hmm. Suffering through positive affirmation. How many, if someone begins to affirm you and affirm you, and affirm you, some of you want to choke them. Not the right reaction, but it proves that you have a struggle. What, what someone affirming you does is expose in you what is not yet dealt with. I better not go down there. I see that's a dangerous road. <laughs> but we need to see that. There is suffering in affirmation, especially if we've come up through rejection and abandonment. I know, because I've been there. It's very difficult to believe even what God says about you. And here's the problem. I can't walk with God unless I agree with him. And he's always right. 
So I have to align myself with what he says about me, even if I have a struggle with that. But you know something? He's able to persuade me. <laughs> okay. We say with the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We go through these things. These are the trying of the word of the Lord in us. They expose in us what needs to be dealt with, but they also cause us, if we hear them, to recognize the dealings of God in the life of others so we can help them through it and cause them to realize, no, this is not God's judgment on you. This is God trying your faith, which is much more precious than gold. Okay? How many know that that, would, that slide in itself would be a sermon and a half, maybe even a series of teachings? <laughs> but every one of these proved the word of the Lord in me. Number seven, sanctification and cleansing. Ephesians 5, 26, the washing of water by the word. Jesus said in John 15, 3, now you are clean, how? Oh, you mean when he speaks, it's a cleansing agent. When he speaks into my being, it's a cleansing agent. And we can see that here, can't we? But what about when he speaks to you prophetically? It's a cleansing word. Usually it's dealing with your mindset that isn't aligned with his. Come on. Both of these passages speak of a cleansing done by the word. It underscores the truth that the word coming to and through us is to do a work in us. The word coming to us and through us is to do a work in us. Both the Logos and the Rhema do a cleansing work if we allow them. Some people are Teflon coated inside. And the Teflon is over the dirt in their life. I use this illustration often, but I really believe that we need to hear it. And that is, when you go into a rest, an old house that's been sitting for a while and turn on the tap, what happens? What color is it? It's rusty. Do you turn it right off or do you leave it run? Well, then why do we stop people from moving prophetically and ministering the word or sharing the word if the word flowing through us can cleanse us? We get upset at people at people's condition but we don't let the gifts, listen, the gifts are gifts. They're not merit badges. But they're, they're the tools of God that clean me up and set me free if I'll move in them and let God use them and let God deal with me as they flow through me. That's why he said prove all things. Because some of the stuff that's going to come out just is very rusty. but leave it flow. Lord, let it flow through them. Let it do a work in them. Let them allow it to take the rust off the pipe and clean the pipe so that the pure water can flow through. God can do everything he's asked me to do without me. He chooses to use me so that he can clean me up and make me ready to dwell with him eternally. Is there an element in the word I'm receiving that has aspects of being able to cleanse me and or cleanse the person or situation I'm prophesying into? The word of the Lord is a cleaning agent. Let it flow through you. And this is an axiom God gave me years ago when he began to teach me some of these principles. While the word flows through you, let it do a work to you. Number eight, Philippians 1, 9 to 11. And this I pray that your love may, be, may abound yet more and more in, the, in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent. 
that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of, the, of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. This is a proving by walking through and experiencing things that are excellent. You know, there's one of the comments that, that the queen made concerning Daniel that just floors me. Under the old covenant, Daniel had an excellent spirit. Lord, if Daniel can have an excellent spirit, bring me to an excellent spirit because Daniel was under the old covenant. And my covenant, according to Corinthians, is better. Lord, bring forth a people with an excellent spirit that if people are going to speak against them, they have to make it up. I want to be one of those. I'm not there yet. You know why? Because people can still find offense in me. But I'm working on it. I'm asking God to work on me. The, the result of this walk should be sincerity and be offense-free. Me being free of offense and me not offending others. God says it's possible. This is a context. Yes. Give that lady the mic, please. So I was thinking about offense and for what's in us. So if we're, if we're pure as far as in our, our actions toward others, but others are offended simply if, if they are not of a, a pure heart. And because I, I look at it like I just had a, experience recently that I wasn't do I was being humbled not really doing anything and, and somebody got a knee-jerk reaction of their past experience so they took offense by me because of their past experience mm -hmm. and I was trying to figure out what what just happened here I, I think all whenever we go through something like that it's right to ask the Lord is it something in me but if he doesn't tell you it's something in you, believe him. You know, I, I've had people so examine themselves that they get depressed. And God, you know, they're trying to figure out what it was. Because they've been taught that if something goes wrong, you're the problem. But if God doesn't say you're the problem, believe him. Oh, I wish I could... <clears throat> Take some time to teach on that. But folks, he says we can be offense-free. Mm -hmm. And he wants to bring us there. So we do not offend and we never get offended. And yet we're, we're gracious, we're uh, sensitive, we're open to the Spirit of God. It's so important. Attitudes are almost, or this is a context for proving the prophetic word of the Lord. Attitudes are almost more important than actions and words. The word of God is quick and powerful and what? Let's look at that. If you have your Bibles turned there. Hebrews 4. And 12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of what? Oh, you mean if it didn't do that, we wouldn't know the difference. You mean the soul can mimic the spirit. I watched that in several revivals where the soul learned what the Spirit was doing. And outwardly, the manifestations looked the same. 
but they didn't have the anointing. And some people were fooled because there was an emotional high in the experience. Dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of what? Oh, you mean thoughts and intents have to be discerned. It's not easy to tell. Are you hearing me? God is more concerned about attitudes. Again, the actions, he can, he can do whatever needs to be acted. Whatever needs to be done, he can do it. He's working on my attitudes and my intentions. The most important attitude is the attitude of love. Note that your love is a growing and expanding thing. The standard for approval is excellence. One of the things that must be remembered is that excellence is defined differently at different stages of growth. What's excellent for an eight-year-old could be considered sloppy for a 12-year-old. And the same is true of spiritual maturity. Daniel came to an excellent spirit in Daniel 5 and 12, and that was the world's testimony of him. Oh my. Lord, bring forth a Daniel company in this hour who walk in an excellent spirit. Knowing the maturity level, a proper understanding of this would produce the following results because it will not expect more than the level of maturity is capable of. Wow. Sincerity at that level. Not offendable or not offending in the last days or the days of Christ. There's coming a, da a people who cannot be offended and who will not offend. Three, full, full of the fruit of the Spirit as well as the fruits of righteousness. By the way, there are nine fruit of the Spirit, right? What are the twelve on the tree of life? In other words, there are more than nine. Yes. When you say <coughs> sorry, sorry. When you say will not offend, when you, oh wait. When you, when you say will not offend, how do you keep other people from seeing you as being offensive when all you're trying to do is follow God? You know, I mean, like, we can't control what other people do. No, but it's because they put expectations on you. Right. Okay. Therefore, they're offended when you don't meet their expectations. It's not, it's not that you offend them. Because your life does, you're, you're walking in a place above offense. Okay. But they're offended because you do not meet their standard of the idol called Christian. I mean, uh, Christian. All right. So when you say cannot be offended, we're in control of that, but we cannot be in control of other people's response to no, us. No, no, we can't. Okay. I mean, Jesus obviously was free of offense, but he offended the Pharisees, and he offended the scribes, and he offended the doctors of the law because they expected him to be a king. They expected him to do things a certain way. They expected him to raise an army and kill all the Romans. So we have to not be offended by them being offended of us. Right. Yes. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Excellent way of putting it, by the way. <laughs> now, all of the above brings praise and glory to his name. God is going, listen, God would not set this standard if he could not bring a people there. We need to raise our vision. The old chorus we used to sing at Christian Community, lift your vision high. We're in a way we've never been before. Yeah. Lift your vision higher and you shall see the glory of the Lord. Yeah. Hebrews 4 and 12, the two-edged sword, a true word from the Lord by any of the ways that God speaks to his children will be open with the motivations and show forth the intentions. 
The difference between soul and spirit can only be discerned, which is an exercise of the spirit. Discernment is something that only the spirit of God can teach us to exercise from our spirit. One of the gifts of the spirit is the gift of discernment. Now listen carefully. The gift of discernment is given to lead us into a lifestyle of discernment. King Solomon did not operate under the gift of discernment. He operated under a lifestyle of discernment. When he said, give, give thy, thy servant an understanding heart that he may discern this thy people, he was, or judge this thy people, for who can judge so great a people? He was saying, the original says, discern thy so great a people. How many know that it took discernment to know which harlot was the mother of that child? And what God did was he placed in Solomon a mother's heart so he would understand how to do it. Well, we won't go into that. <laughs> All right? 1 Kings 3 and 9, a discerning heart. It's a lifestyle. God wants to bring us into a lifestyle of discernment and a lifestyle of discernment is going to be essential in these days. Although the initial gift of discernment causes us to be able to discern the motivation, God indicates that what needs to be discerned when we what needs to be discerned when we study what he says must be discerned. I, let me illustrate this. I love this illustration. Turn to Malach is it Malachi? Malachi? Malachi. Okay. And chapter 3 and verse 18. Then shall you return and, what? Discern between the righteous and the wicked. Oh, you mean you can't tell by looking? And between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. That's discern. Illustration. Jesus said... <clears throat> That when he comes, two shall be in the field. One shall be taken, the other shall be left. Now, we're not going to argue over which one's which. But let me say this. That they're both doing the same thing. They're both bringing in the harvest. And to look at them, you wouldn't know which was which. It had to be... It says two shall be... Um, grinding at the mill. Two shall be processing the word of God, making bread for ministry so that they can minister to God's people. One shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two shall seemingly be at rest in the bed. Seemingly at rest in God. One shall be taken, the other shall be left. It must be discerned. very important that we recognize this and begin to say, God, teach me how to come into a lifestyle of discernment, which also obviously will help you in discerning prophetic word and words ministered from the pulpit. The final test. Does walking out that which I hear lead me into a deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, or does it lead me away from him? Anything that leads me away from the Lord Jesus is not of God, period. There's no negotiation on that. Two, anything that does not in some way reveal more of God is not of God. Three, does it in any way take away from my relationship with Jesus? If it does, it's not of God. Four, supernatural revelation, encounters, and experiences can cause me to focus on them, leading me away from a Christ-centered life. How many know that 
supernatural experiences and encounters are distracting. How many know the story or the, the incident of Elijah and Elisha? Yeah. And here we have, they've crossed the Jordan, and Elijah says, if you see me when I'm taken up, you'll get what you ask for. He said, this is a hard thing, but if you see me when I'm taken up, what does it say happened? Hmm? A chariot and a whirlwind. Which one did Elijah go up in? The whirlwind. Which would be more spectacular? The chariot of fire. A divine distraction to see if you can keep your focus. God is going to test my focus. It, will it remain on Jesus or will I be distracted by the divine encounter? Second Corinthians 12 and 7, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation. So what does abundance of revelation, what's the danger? Becoming exalted or proud of my revelation. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. It was not a physical problem. It was a messenger of Satan to buffet me. I have this sneaky prophetic suspicion that it was the Jewish community. The scribes, the Pharisees, and the synagogues. Because what? who followed him all around? Because they didn't understand his prophetic interpretation of the word. Hear that. Those that will be your thorn in the flesh will not be those who do not know God. It will be those who have an agenda for you. And you're not meeting their agenda. In other words, it could be people in the same church. In the early church, there were the two factions. Okay? And it was because the Jewish faction had an expectation and didn't believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of their expectation. One of the things that God spoke to me years ago, he said, Bill, he said, all those up to the cross, the Jews up to the time of the cross, were saved. Because they were walking in all the light they had, which was the sacrifices and the offerings, and all those things. If you look at that, Jesus said, I came not to the Gentiles, but to the, who? The lost sheep. Oh, you mean they were already saved? Of the house of Israel. And remember this. The gospel is still to the Jew first. I want to make that clear. I am not in any way anti-Semitic. But I'm trying to get something through to us that those who are going to oppose us are going to be those who don't understand what God is doing. Yeah. And they can be people of, Jesus said, your enemies will be those of your own household. Own household. For years, my aunts and uncles said, you need to go out and get a job. I was teaching at college. You need to go get a job, do lawnmower or something. But Because <laughs> I was, they didn't believe I was called a minister. The one who propagated that the most before she passed asked me to forgive her. But I wasn't within the demon of the denomination. So I couldn't be called of God to do what I was doing. But then God took her out of the denomination. <laughs> and she realized, wait a minute. 
But all those years, she was speaking against me, against my ministry, trying to get the whole family against me. How many know that was a test on Dale? Yes. Was I going to keep a right heart and a right attitude? It hurt. There's no question it hurt. You can't be hurt by people you don't love. Okay? It hurt, but because I kept the right attitude, they came around. Okay? So it's important to remember that. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. The danger of abundance of revelation is exaltation and pride. Now I recommend reading in the voice of God the section on discerning the word of the Lord because there's a lot more in there than we were able to cover tonight. So I've set aside here a little time for discussion and questions. Are there any? Forgive me for being overly sensitive, but you, you said something, and I, I know your heart, so I know just, but for those people who are watching online, and you said something to the effect of the Jewish people that right. didn't, well, the Jewish people did, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders, the, the, the people who were in ministry, so right. to speak, yep. they didn't understand yep. it, but the, the flocks of people yeah. They understood who he was and what was yeah. happening. So many, many of them did. And those those that persecuted Paul, and they literally followed him from place to place, were those that were sent forth by the leaders. So but yes, give give uh, <clears throat> when you were talking about the thorn in the flesh and how you describe that would you would you say that that was perhaps a religious spirit that was a part of that whole thing? I do I, I think it was I think it was a religious spirit um, in one sense it would also include what happened at Ephesus wouldn't it because that was a religious spirit that rose up about the goddess Diana so it, it, we, we, we use the Jewish leaders because they're the ones most prominent throughout the book of Acts and throughout the writings of Paul. But we've got to see that what happened at Ephesus was a religious spirit rising up to try and consolidate and keep what the gospel was able to disband. So, it, it was definitely a religious spirit. Okay? Okay, under the uh, cleansing and sanctification. Yes. Uh, a prophetic word. Okay, when a person receives a prophetic word and it doesn't come to pass. My question is, could it be that they have not met what they were supposed to do on their end? Absolutely. Remember, every throughout Scripture, all prophetic word is conditional. Okay? Rare, you know, you could say, but Abraham wasn't conditional. Yes, God said, because I know he will command his children after me, I'm going to tell him. In other words, he knew that Abraham would fulfill the condition before he gave him the word. I, there, there are rare, and I can't think of one right now, but let's put it this way, 99% of prophetic words conditional. So there's always an if in some senses. If you will do this, I will do this. And you can, that's clear when he prophesied to Israel, isn't it? Throughout the, the, prof, the major prophets and the minor prophets. It isn't always as evident in the New Covenant 
when the prophecies are given. But there's always a condition. There's God's portion, man's portion. That's why I like the whole balance beam issue. There's God's responsibility, things only he can do. But there's my responsibility, that's to fulfill the if. Got another one. Okay. Okay. Because you say, and I told David coming, that if I don't remember anything you've ever taught, I will remember this. We are to grow up into him in all things. Right. I mean, that is so embedded in me. So the very sensitive topic that came out today was about offense and how do we prevent others when we're in true sincerity, not meaning to offend. And I think my question is, if we are to grow up into him in all things in this, could it be that he could help us, okay, to trust in him, that our relationship with him is so solid that we are so hidden in Christ that the offense, we're not offended because they are offended because our life is so hid in Christ that our relationship in that trust level that he knows us, we know him. Is that a safety net to pray into that, that our relationship becomes to that degree that we are not an offense to anyone. Absolutely, absolutely. If he said, blessed are they who are not offended in me, that means we can come to a place where, the, where there's no offense. It's important for us to, when, when God makes some of these statements, we pass over that he's saying it's possible. If God, if God says, if you do this, I'll do this, he will do that, and he will give me the grace and the enablement to do my portion of that responsibility. I don't have to, I don't have to wonder how to do it. The Holy Spirit came to lead me and guide me into the experiencing and the fulfillment of all truth. It's like you have a, a, a grace raincoat on you. Right. Okay, one more question. Sure. On uh, the final test, page seven, uh, it's you listed the name, the the things that are proof of a final test. My question is, number one, if they're led away, if it leads you away, it's not of God. It's not well, of God, right? Well, could it be you walk away because of conviction? Yeah, so yeah, it could, could be. be a word. In other words, you're offended. <coughs> but I mean, it could be a word of God. It, it, yeah, and, it, and, but they walked away because of conviction. Yeah, yeah, but the thing is, it didn't lead you away. The word did not lead you away. You cannot govern anyone else's response. Oh, they're that. tested. They're yeah. tested by their response. But the word that came to you and through you did not lead you away from him. Okay. Okay. Because okay. that's if I'm rightly if I'm my heart is right and I respond right to the to the word and the dealings of God, it's going to bring me closer and closer to him. It's going to cause me to let him change my nature to be more and more like his. Okay, I got nothing. Anybody else want the mic for a while? <laughs> okay. Because I didn't understand. You talk about impartation. Yes. And that God will take out what others have imparted into us and oh. leave a footprint. No, what, what I'm saying is that experience God was showing me. He put it back. He put the impartation back. But I needed to know how much impartation was there because the contact was over, what, 30 or, 30 or 40 years. Okay. Okay. And I did not know, I did a, he wanted to teach me a lesson of how much there is in impartation. So the lesson is the footprint? The, the lesson, I called it impartation footprint because when you think of a footprint in the snow, which is where I was when I got that, 
in the snow, it gives you the full outline and the depth of what was done. He wanted me to know that, then he gave all that impartation back. He didn't keep it. He, it was an experience okay. whereby I would understand the value of impartation. Because, yeah. you know, I had it as a, as a theology. Right. <laughs> but I, I tell you, now it's not a theology anymore. <laughs> okay, last question. Uh, you said substance and eternity. Explain. What is the substance? Okay, just briefly, there's positional truth, right? Right. And there's possession of truth. In between the two is the process of truth. The process of truth where it's substance in me. Illustration. The best illustration is Jesus. He was the lamb slain when? He was the word made. But he still had to come down into time, manifest truth in time. And when you see him in Revelation, he's the man upon the throne. In, Re in Exodus 24, I think it is, where the elders went up into the mountain and so on, it said they saw God as the body of heaven in its clearness. In other words, they could see the outline, but they couldn't see the substance. In Revelation, you see the man upon the throne. There's substance on the throne. The lamb upon the throne. So, in all these teachings that you've taught us, uh, whatever revelation that we gain from that, that becomes substance? That becomes substance in you, exactly. Okay. And listen, not everyone gets the same substance. Because God allows me to obtain the substance that's part of my expression of him. And each one of us has a unique combination of an expression of him. Listen, he is so much bigger than anything we can conceive of. And it's going to take the full body of Christ to manifest his greatness in the end time. Each one of us is going to have a uniqueness of the character and nature of Jesus to manifest. Yes. It seems like what you're saying about all this manifestation, um, why they're the advantage of a fivefold ministry and not just one person being the, the voice for the Lord because we have different perspectives from our, well, to our giftings and our personalities, but for, is that what you're saying? I'm saying that, but let me let me go there because I love this fivefold ministry stuff. The, the apostolic ministry is called to express Jesus, the chief apostle. Amen. That's going to take a corporate apostolic ministry. The prophetic office is called to manifest the prophet like unto Moses. Jesus the prophet like unto Moses. The teaching ministry is called to, 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 uh, to manifest Jesus the teacher sent from God. The evangelist, Jesus the evangelist, is the, Jesus the man with beautiful feet. And Jesus, the chief, the pastor, the chief shepherd. And it's going to take corporate, multiple, to manifest the fullness of that. And he's reserved that for the end time. It's part of greater things than these shall you do. It's not just because it's a corporate expression. It's because there are things that he reserved to be manifested in the end time to bring his body to full, complete maturity. And it can only be done through a corporate ministry. It can't be done through one man. It can't be done through a one-man show. God is, listen, if we do not learn to submit to the moving of the Spirit in the mul multiplicity of ministry, God's going to destroy the one-man ministry. Did you say that one again? I said, if we do not learn to submit 
to the multiple ministry, the five-fold ministry in its function and flow in our local assemblies, God is going to shut down the one-man show. He is, he is not playing around. He is serious about this. He's going to have a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He promised, and I'm keeping him to his promise. I would like to add to that that there's, there's room for everybody to be involved. There's yes. hospitality and there's you people who go to prisons and there's this and there's, I mean, there's, there's a multitude of things, house to house and, you know, all this. So it's not just the fivefold, it's activating everybody. And I think that's what he's after. That's the, that's, be after what he said. That's the function of the fivefold ministry, to activate everybody. Amen. That's, that's their job, yes. Is that the greater works? That's part of the greater works. See, it isn't that Jesus couldn't have done everything while he was here, Okay. It's not the limitation of Jesus. It's the self-limitation of Jesus so that at the end time, there could be greater works. It's not anything. He, he could have done it all. And through his corporate body, he's going to do it all. But he reserves some things for the end time so there'd be such a display of his glory that men would not be able to doubt who he is. Do it while he was on this earth, but in measure? Yeah, he did enough that he became the example of the whole thing. Okay? When when I finally recognized that, I was at the college and the Lord began to deal with me about those five expressions. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to write on it. I thought it would be one nice little course, you know. Turned out to be six courses. Wow. And the reason is that he, when I begin to look through, the, and by the way, we need to get back to the Gospels. If we look at the, at, at the writings from Acts on, we need to interpret it in the light of what Jesus did. Our problem is we don't know Jesus. It's the problem in the church, and that's why there's all the hullabaloo and all this stuff going on. God is getting ready to cleanse his church. I want to be on the right side of the cleaning bucket. <laughs> okay? But he, he, he's got to clean it in order to get that flow through the body of the greater works. <sighs> Any other questions? I've got how a minute. Do we get there? <laughs> how, how do we get there? Part of it is recognize where we're at. Recognize that we're not as mature as we think we are. Part of our problem is we think we know it all. We don't know anything as we ought to know. If the Apostle Paul, who wrote so many books in the New Testament, said he knew nothing as he ought to know it, Okay? Then if he didn't, I don't. But the thing is, a relationship with Jesus is going to bring us into that greater glory. Could if be, Paul... If, could be two parts to this, the fear of the Lord and the hunger for him? The fear of the Lord, the hunger. Listen, God is getting ready to release the seven spirits of God on his church to bring them to that place. It's going to take the functioning of the seven spirits and the outpouring of those seven spirits of God to bring us there. Nothing less will bring us there. Would you identify what those seven spirits are, please? Isaiah 11 and 2. Okay, just, just let's read that. I was asked to identify those seven spirits of God. For those on tape or on, on learning. Isaiah 11 and 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Remember when we talked about this, we talked about the umbrella. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. It's going to take that anointing to destroy all the yokes 
that have been put on the body of Christ. Okay. Let me move on. It's getting... Conclusion. There is so much in the realm of the prophetic. Another course would be the treating of the prophetic scriptures, examining them for other principles that would take the studier deeper into the understanding of Moses' declaration to Joshua and the other 68 elders. Numbers 11, 29. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Lord, we pray that you would take the spirit of this course, place it in our spirits, or in the spirits of those who've taken the course. Help us to give ourselves to these truths and cause them to work out in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now just hold on for a second. I want to give two announcements. Okay? From April the 11th, the 18th, the 24th, and May 2nd, Dr. Bez is going to do the studies of Ruth. And he, he said this was a good announcement, so I'll read it. <laughs> We're entering the days of harvest. Ruth came to Israel at harvest time. This series will be taught over a period of four weeks, focusing on Ruth's time in the harvest and some of the spiritual principles hidden in the biblical narrative. Dr. Bez will merge historically important highlights of the book with spiritual principles hidden within it to bring forth relevant applications for our lives today. And then this announcement. Spiritual parallels and that's it. This, by the way, this is one of my wife's favorite courses. She's been agitating to have me teach it ever since we started teaching. She finally won. She finally won. Actually, the Lord finally won, said she was right. <laughs> Took him a while to convince me. No. Uh, I was persuaded. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 12 and 12, whereas the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body be many, are one body, so also is Christ. By the way, the original says, so also is the Christ. And we'll explain that more when we get into it. Is it possible to understand this illustration the Apostle Paul uses? Of course, my answer is yeah. yes. Are there applications that can help us understand what God wants in interrelating the members representing the cells, the muscles, the organs, and the head? Yes. And the answer is yes. And we're going to look into that in this first course on the net spiritual parallels. Amen. How many weeks is this one? Well, hopefully, I usually do a 13 week, is usually, unless God interrupts. Like, like he did with the, this course. He dropped that revelation on me on the destroying of the oaks, which was essential for us. Yes. You know, yes. so. All right, folks. We love you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. You know, it's easier to teach with people in the audience. I love the folks online. I'm glad they came. And glad that they, some of them have been with us the whole 14 weeks. We're so thankful for that. But I also love to have people I can look at and have fun with. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. <laughs> and watch them say, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Like the first time you taught about the seven spirits. <laughs> yeah.